All right, welcome to the show, YouTubers. Drop in your questions and takes in the chat. Hit the like and the subscribe button as we set you up for what will be a fantastic weekend of domestic soccer action. Great show today, everybody. We have El Clasico, Liverpool, Manchester City, Le Classique. We have the Turin Derby, and we also have so much more to get into, including a little bit of Bundesliga, which I'm very much excited about. I've got Nigel Rio Coker and James Bench with me today, so sit back, relax, let us entertain you. Keiko Lazzo begins right now. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining the show. Nigel Rio Coker, James Bench with me. Nigel, how are you doing, man? I'm great, thank you, my friend. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. My daughter just arrived from Europe. Haven't seen her for a few months, so it's great to see her. She's getting older. It's reminding me how much older I am getting. So thanks for asking. I'm doing great. James Bench, how are you, man? I know you're busy today. How's things going? Yeah, it's a bit of a hectic one today, but um, yeah, I'm fantastic. And you're right. You two are very old children and all that. Much too early <laughs> for me to get into. <laughs> Well, if anybody out there is enjoying Kego Lazzo, please let us know in the comments below. We're going to discuss El Clasico first and foremost, and I'm sure there is a lot to discuss about El Clasico. So if you are a fan of either of these clubs or you just love soccer in general, please drop in a comment, join in the conversation. There's a lot to get through. Nigel, I'm going to start with you. This is... A, cl a cracking game to look forward to. I mean, really, if you look at the top of La Liga standings right now, the way Barcelona have started the domestic campaign has been sensational. Not so great in the Champions League after what we would just witness yesterday. But this is a great game to look forward to and a real test for Barcelona. Obviously, Real Madrid, in my opinion, would be a favourite going into this game. But Barca not conceding many goals at all in the league right now. They should go in with a lot of confidence with what they're doing domestically. Well, Ian, it's El Clasico. El Clasico is very similar to basically a Champions League clash. It, it's massive. And we've seen, for me, Barcelona still stutter when it comes to playing those same teams who were seen in the same pedigree and structure as they are. Struggled against Bayern Munich, just about got a draw against Inter Milan and lost to Inter Milan. This is Real Madrid. And even Real Madrid are still not playing at their greatest potential. But still, I feel that Real Madrid has a lot more character, a lot more strength, and I'll probably say they've got a lot more threats in that final third than what I've seen so far of Barcelona. I think for me with Barcelona, I've only really seen them being heavily reliant on Dembele to create and heavily mm -hmm. reliant on Lewandowski to put the ball in the back of the net. You look at what Barcelona, what Real Madrid can come up with, with their front three, Vinicius Jr. and um, all the other players that they've got available. I think it's going to be, for me, advantage Real Madrid. It's going to be another big test. It's going to be Barcelona's biggest test domestically that we're going to see so far. But I would still give the edge to Real Madrid, Ian. Yeah, but Nigel, you do know that Barcelona have only conceded one goal from the eight games that they've played in La Liga so far. So I guess and you have tell to me stay... from the one goal that they've conceded, who really has been a challenge that they've played? Well, I mean, they have been tested somewhat. I know they rely oh. heavily on, on Lewandowski. Well, I mean, even at the weekend, oh. they played Vigo what last weekend at so home. Far, Ian, that you could say that they've been tested? Let's be real. Not, not Real Madrid this. quality. Not Real Madrid quality. I'm getting there. Okay. And, and of course, it is a Champions League type of fixture. It is El Clasico, probably the greatest fixture in European club football. James would probably disagree with that, obviously, after the North London derby. <laughs> North London derby. James, what do you think? Obviously, Nigel's getting stuck into Barcelona right now after watching their performance yesterday, which was defensively a bit poor, and a major poor decision defensively from a lot of those players. But how do you see this game playing out? Who do you see as a favourite? And uh, would you say that because they have the home field advantage, Real Madrid would fancy themselves? I mean, I 100 million, billion percent agree with everything Nigel said about Barcelona. He is completely spot on. You know, in both regards, this is a Barcelona team that isn't going to get tested very often in La Liga. That's the simple reality of it. And in La Liga, all the issues that we said were going to come at the start of the season when they were radically revamping the squad, they don't really matter for all that much because you don't need systems. You don't need tactical plans or identity. If you've got mm -hmm. Usman Dembele and Robert Lewandowski and the other team don't have anyone kind of on the level to lace their boots. <laughs> but when you come to the Champions League, you discover that other teams have their Lewandowski, they have their uh, Dembele, they have their players that are a lot better than Gerard Piquet is nowadays. And it turns out they've been playing with them for quite a long time. That's the real struggle that Barcelona has. I, I mean, and do you think it's so strange that Xavi's going into this game under a little bit of pressure from the most vocal contingent 
of Barcelona on the internet. I don't know how much that will co- translate to the new Camp. I think kind of <laughs> let's take a step back and really appreciate what the last year has been like. Particularly, let's kind of look through that online Barcelona sphere. Um, when Joan Laporta started pulling his economic levers and all that, and he's now just pulled the Europa League trapdoor and that's set them, they're going flying through that, uh, the consensus had to be that he was doing this to strengthen the squad because the squad wasn't good enough. Yep. The squad wasn't good enough, even though Xavi took the, the one that was significantly rebuilt in January to second. So Xavi clearly must be a great manager if he took that squad to second. But now he's been given these great players and he's not. It's Xavi's fault, apparently. The club's in frankly, in more chaos off the pitch than has been reflected on the pitch. And it just, when it gets tested against the best teams, I I think it's going to come up short for a little while now. I really like everything Madrid have done. Good signings. I I guess Rudiger won't play, but he's been excellent. chuamani has been a great addition. They're defensively a little bit stronger. I mean, I think they look better than the team that won the Champions League. We'll see if that means whether they can win the Champions League. Great point. I think so as well, James. I think you're right. And, um, I think for me, what we've got to understand and people listening, they've got to face the reality of this. Barcelona took a massive gamble. They were in financial disarray. Mm -hmm. They took a gamble by getting certain players in. Now their Champions League hopes hangs in the balance. And I think they expected the minimum to get out of the group stages. Mm -hmm. If they don't get out of group stages, that's going to be financial catastrophe for Barcelona again, where they're going to have to let certain players go. And let's be realistic what's going on in world football right now. You talk about Mbappe. You've already seen Lewandowski's form. Could Lewandowski be one of the players that they have to let go of? They're already talking about maybe getting Messi next summer. So how this unfolds for them in the Champions League, let's just forget domestically how big this game is. But they took a big gamble and it's not working out right now. And their fate might not be in their hands to get out of the next round for the financial rewards yeah. that they need. Nigel, though, if they win this game, though, and this goes to my question as to who needs to win this game more, Um, obviously with what we're saying right now, it would be Barcelona who needs to win this game more. If they do win this game, they're top of the table above Real Madrid. Very comfortably so, though. So how can can we say, though, James, that things are not going well at Barcelona when they're top of La Liga standings? Go ahead, James. I'm with James. Because Barcelona are, barring catastrophe, a lock for the top two in La Liga every year. And, like, I know it will be great for Barcelona fans in May if they win La Liga. But if you're remortgaging your future, that needs to be with a view to getting access to what is actually, by Barcelona standards, a lot of money from Champions League prize money and broadcast revenue from going deep. (laughs) Like, this team, the team that ended last season would probably have been there or thereabouts, maybe within three points of of Real Madrid. So what you've kind of done is absolutely, you know, taking a machete to your finances for the next 25 years. Yeah, And and we do have to keep hammering this point home, no matter how well they play over the next few years, because, you know, Pedri will be long retired while they're still dealing with the decisions that were made this summer. (laughs) You know... It's they've taken point. a machete to their finances. No, you're, you're 100% what, right. It looks James. like he's maybe three or four points more in La Liga. I, I, and I think that James, is, James, you're right. Because I think for me, it's the point you're making is 100% right in the sense of they took a big gamble, Ian, on the finances. That's the bigger thing. And I think for yeah. them, there's greater rewards in the Champions League financially succeeding there than there is in La Liga. They're already expected to compete in La Liga. And like I said, we're giving them great credit. I haven't considered when do they really get tested in La Liga? It's when they play Atletico, when they play Real Madrid, and maybe when they used to play Sevilla, when Sevilla were a lot more competitive. That's it. So you really expect them to do well. But if they don't do well now, I think, like you said already, there's more pressure on Barcelona to win this game just for a confidence kind of level. Because if they don't win this, it's going to be Armageddon at Barcelona again for a while, press-wise. And for the next round of Champions League game, it's going to be Armageddon. There's going to be tremendous pressure for them to win it. They've got aging players like PK. Um, Basquets, Busquets, mm-hmm. who shouldn't mm-hmm. really be there or be as a vital, pivotal role in this Barcelona team now. They, they mm-hmm. needed to evolve. They mismanaged financially for a long time and they took a gamble. And now there's a point where the gamble might not pay off. And I just think right now, like James said again, 100% agree. This Real Madrid side looks way better all way round, done the great investment. And even now, Real Madrid is sitting back at the Mbappe scenario and just laughing and saying, oh, let's just see how this plays out. Yeah. There, yeah, there you're watching. Really good, 
Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say there was a really good line in, uh, I think it was, I, I can't quite remember where it was in the Spanish press a few years ago, where Sergio Ramos was always competing with Gerard Piquet over who was the highest paid centre-back. And then the uh, d- details leaked about the size of Gerard Piquet's contract. And Ramos just looked at it and went, oh, right. I'm not anywhere, anywhere close to what he's earning. <laughs> you know, it's, that's kind of why where they are, where they are off the pitch. And, you know, we talk about yeah. they'll want to lose PK, they'll want to lose Busquets. Until their contracts expire, absolutely no one is paying them what Barcelona pay them. Ian, just yeah. a quick one, right? Last thing I'm saying. Don't you just think, though, this is a reminder of people to realise and football fans to realise no player is ever big, bigger than the club. Because that's what happens when you try and make players get bigger than the clubs. You get. Can I can I ask you a question? Because I heard a comment this morning, and and it really got me thinking. You said no player is bigger than the club. Would you say, and this is in a different league, but hot topic right now? Would you say Mbappe is bigger than Paris Saint Germain? Paris Saint Germain have let Mbappe think he's bigger than Paris Saint Germain. They let that happen. So he's not. So so you're saying that Mbappe is not bigger than Paris Saint Germain? I don't think any player is ever bigger than any club. You cannot tell me that Mbappe is bigger than Paris Saint Germain. No, I've seen legends before Mbappe, who are absolutely astonishing players, great human beings, and they never acted like they were bigger than the club. It's the problem is these clubs let these players get like that. If I was Paris Saint Germain, I would have sold him. That's my opinion. You get your money back in, you reinvest, and you move on. That's what Alex Ferguson did the best, and that's what Alex Ferguson is going to go down as one of the greatest managers in world football. You sell them at the right time, and you let players know you're never going to be bigger than the club. Because if your club stays successful, that's all that matters. And again, Real Madrid is one of the biggest clubs in the world. They are sitting back right now, laughing at this situation. And they've had superstars after superstars after superstars. Is there anyone that's bigger than Real Madrid? No. We can never say that. But Barcelona at one point let Lionel Messi, one of the greats of the game, become bigger than the club. And now they are suffering tremendously just because of what they did to keep Lionel Messi and allocate. They could have made so much money if they sold Lionel Messi a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. You're watching Kegel Lad, so it's Ian Joy with Nigel Rio Coker and James Bench. We're discussing the Clasico, Real Madrid against Barcelona, Barcelona's troubles right now. Please let us know in the comments if you've got a comment to share, if you're a supporter of either of these clubs or you just want to make a comment on this game, who you think will win. What do you think about Barcelona's situation right now? Natalie comes in and says, without a doubt, Barca needs this more. Great comment coming in from Natalie right there. Matt Osman, Madrid are going to slaughter that Barcelona defense and it's hard to question that, even though they only conceded one goal in La Liga. They were very poor defensively in the Champions League and have been found out a lot this season in the Champions League. We've got a great comment from Xavi today on Fabrizio Romano's Twitter timeline. Xavi said, I am sad. I am angry. I apologize because it's everyone's mistake. We had put put it into our heads not to fail, but we did. We tell Barca fans that we will work to turn the table around and win titles. James, do you feel sorry a little bit for Xavi being put in this situation? Obviously, he's dealing with a lot of players. Um, and a lot of money's been spent, obviously, on salaries. They're trying to get free transfers in. It's a financial mess at the moment in time. But he's the one who's in charge of trying to get it right here. And at times, it's going to be difficult for him. Do you feel a bit sorry for him? Um, yes, I do. I mean, obviously, no one made him made him work for Barcelona. He can, And he's welcome to not work for Barcelona. He's paid very well to do so. Um, but... It's a it's a real hiding to nothing, and I think kind of specifically looking at that quote, and you know, I mean, he turning it round in the table in the Champions League, it's totally out of their hands. Unless Victoria pulls and do something unbelievable, they're gone. And I think just kind of to belabor the point about the finances, kind of anyone could have told you this might happen. Barcelona had this last year. If you're not a top seed, even if you are a top seed, but quite often if you're not a top seed in a Champions League draw, the draw can be horrible to you. And they just got incredibly unlucky that they ran into a, a a fantastic Bayern Munich team and an Inter Milan team that could absolutely beat them. And, you know, everyone knew in the summer that that's the sort of, that's a scenario that could happen. So I, I feel, I feel Xavi's been dealt a really tough hand here. I mean, equally what I would say is he could have managed this team anytime he wanted, you know, the job was there whenever he fancied it. Um, he probably did not pick the right time to be Barcelona manager. <laughs> no, 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 James. I don't feel not an ounce of sorry for him whatsoever. And I think that for me, yes, it's not probably all he's blame, but a lot of it does need to fall in the hands of those who run Barcelona. 
And this is when I go about people talk about the, let's just say the corporate side of football. And I don't want to be harping so long about this. Why are we feeling sorry for Barcelona when they could see they should have had a lot more common sense and smart people running the club where they could see what was going on financially with the contracts they were giving to players at the time? You give credit. I give credit to the likes of Bayern Munich. Look at how they run their club and how they continue to get top class players there to compete domestically and to compete at Champions League without having these type of issues that Barcelona do. So why would we feel sorry for people being put in powers of position to do their job? And obviously they didn't do their job. They did not do their job good enough. And then obviously, yes, Xavi's come in there trying to do the best he can working with what he can. What else could no he have one... done though, Nigel? What else could Xavi have done, he especially have in the Champions League? He didn't have to take the job. Like James said, he could have taken it another time, but he chose to take, take it. So if you're choosing to take it, you know what's happening. I can't feel sorry for you because you're going now knowing what's happening. Why should I feel sorry for you? You're a club legend, but you know the situation. You were there as part of the, situ as part of the situation that was going on at the club. I have mm -hmm. no sympathy for you because you know what you're walking into. It's the same thing as saying, I feel sympathy for Mbappe right now because Paris Saint-Germain haven't kept their promises when initially he wanted to leave. You chose to stay for financial gain and all these little loopholes or whatever it is they put in your contract. And now you're acting like a child, throwing your toy out the pram because you haven't got what you wanted. I don't feel sorry for your sympathy for you. Deal with it. And I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to let people take accountability for decisions that they make. Great point right there. All right, let's get your predictions on this one here. And I want to get predictions from anybody out there who's watching. And you are watching Kegel Lat. So whether you're sitting in your car, whether you're in school, whether you're at work, doesn't matter where you are in the world right now. If you're sitting back and relaxing and enjoying the show, we want to hear from you. Drop in your comments. Share some love as well for Nigel and James Bench who are joining us today. <laughs> share some love for James. James looks like he wants to punch me in my face right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. James... It. James is ready to get stuck into it. And actually, I appreciate what James is doing. He's just saying, Nigel, you are on one today. We're going to let you have the stage. So, Nigel, <laughs> real coker, give us your prediction on this game. Real Madrid favorites to win the game. Who are you going for? Mate, I'm going for a 3-1 Real Madrid win. 3-1. Who scores the goals, Nigel? Vinicius Jr. He's on fire, by the way. I tell you what, I love watching uh, the kid play, man. I think, I have a feeling Chao Mini will score, get on a score sheet as well. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Chumini. Nearly. It's Chumini. Good, isn't it? Um, it really good. Chumini. You're getting and, closer. Um, <sighs> Rudiger's definitely out. He's not going to be playing, is he? No. Nah. All right, let's move on from you. You're taking too long. James, what you got for me? You know when you spend like forever going like <laughs> on one specific topic, talking about how much of a disaster it is, and you know that in the end, all you've done is set yourself up to look very foolish. So I'm going <laughs> to so give myself an eight. Now. And I'm going to predict Barcelona win this 3-2. Oh, my wow. God. James, real quickly I mean, before we move on to the next game, though, how, how do they get the job done, though? Is that a Lewandowski hat trick you're coming out with? You? Yeah, something like that. These games are stupid. I mean, yes. I know that usually they go to form, <laughs> but, you know, I, I get to use the whole it's a derby, throw the form book out of the window thing. And... I, so I basically, I spent all of yesterday saying Tottenham Frankfurt is going to be dreadful and realised that in doing so, I'd forced a narrative where um, Tottenham Frankfurt was the second best game of the week. And I think what we've done here by continually slating Barcelona is added some fuel to the fire. I'm sure J Xavi will have this on in the dressing room <laughs> before the game uh, and Barcelona will go and win it 3-2. Wait, can, can we not? Can I let go? Just say something. Do we not think that Real Madrid are very motivated as well, knowing it's El Clasico? Do we think Real Madrid is going to be comfortable? No, they're going to be very. They have Carlos Ancelotti, one of yeah. the great managers of this game, winning manager at the highest level. Do you think he's going to have his players relaxed and chilling? Real Madrid. Yes, is Carlos Ancelotti. No, they're going to be. Re oh, listen, that's a red one up for this game. He's gonna have one of your cigars, Nigel. On he the probably bench. is gonna have one of my cigars, and after they win, I'm gonna smoke a cigar in his honor and send a picture to James. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt about it. Listen, he had um, also has to recognize that also they've conceded seven goals in the league so far, and it's not a lot of goals to concede considering the fact that Barcelona have only conceded that one goal. You would expect Barca to maybe go with a tactical, tactical approach here to try and frustrate, but as James Ben just pointed out here, these games. Anything can happen in these games and expect Barcelona to turn up and just go for it in the game. I do think that Lewandowski gets on the score sheet. I do believe that. 
This is his opportunity in El Clasico to turn it on, to show the world who Lewandowski is. So I do expect Lewandowski to turn up. But if Real Madrid, to Nigel's point, if Real Madrid play well, if Real Madrid play 90% of their game, they should be too good for this Barcelona side, regardless of who goes out there. It is El Clasico. Classico, but that's you what James's point is. Anything can happen. There you There's go. Real oh, right mate, there. By the way, I'm buying them <laughs> shades as well. I know those, those shades. I've got them on order. They're coming as well. You'd suit them very much so. We got Rafa in the house. He says, Nigel, you are spitting fire today. He believes that Real Madrid will get the victory by three goals to one. James Bench has gone for a 3-2 Barcelona win. Nigel is expecting Real Madrid to really win this game. I'm going to go for a high score and draw. I think this one's going to be a 2-2 game, 3-3 game. I think it's going to be goals galore in this game. I really hope that's going to be the case. All right, let's turn our attention to what else is happening around La Liga before we move on to the Premier League. We have a great game between third and fourth place. It's Athletic Club Bilbao against Atletico Madrid. I just want to read Nigel Rio Coca and get a quick comment from you. Another tweet from Fabrizio Romano. Um, Atletico Madrid president uh, Cesero Cerezo, I can't even pronounce his name correctly, on Jao Felix's future. He said, Jao Felix is going to succeed here at Atletico Madrid. Mbappe, question mark, we have no interest in him, even if he'd no have money, a place man. in every team. And then he also said, Simeone's future? What? Cholo is our head coach, and God willing, he will be our head coach for a long, long time. Time. So regardless of what you said on this podcast, apparently it's not been listening, Nigel. Atleti are sticking with Cholo Simeone. Thoughts? Nah, I th listen, honestly, I think it's great. I think that means they're going to give him time. Because um, the thing is, he, he is a good manager. But the problem he's going to have now is he's going to have to get into the recruitment department and try and find those outliners in this generation of footballers who would suit his management style. So that's what he has to do. Because if he gets the players that play for Simeone, they'll be a very tough and difficult team. They'll be a very successful team. But this now has to go into the recruiting part when you talk about outliers. And for the fans that's listening, let me say when I say outliners, just a quick story. When I went back to England towards the end of my career, just before I, I finished training and whatever it is, I went to West Ham, I trained. In the first three minutes of training, there was a young Declan Rice training. And I went straight to the coach, who's this kid? And they said, yeah, he's the under-21's cap uh, captain or under-23's at the time. I said, this kid should be in the first team. I knew that kid was different and an outliner from our generation where if he was training with us, I knew he would be a captain and a leader and I knew it in three minutes. So there are outliners there where they can play in that old school generation. You talk about Jude Bellingham, he's another one who could play in that old school generation. Simeone needs to get in that department and they're going to obviously give him time and stick by him. If he can get six or seven players like that, then I'm sure he'll make them a very successful team again. James, do you have anything to add on Atleti's situation right now in Simeone? Uh, no, because I just find them... I tried to watch their game against uh, Club Bruges because I was convinced that the Club Bruges thing had to stop eventually. But even though it looks like Simon Mignolet is the best performing goalkeeper in the Champions League. Amazing. And I mean, just like Nigel was saying, it's just I've never seen a group of players that's such an awkward fit for a manager that's been there for... for 10 years. Yeah, but like, hasn't it always been like that though, James? Has, hasn't it always been hard to watch though, Atleti? I mean, I, I yeah. find it personally. I find Atleti hard to no. watch. I know producer I mean, Dez yeah, is a fan, never but been, they, they annoy me. They've Come on. never been Let, elegant. James, but... Come on. Let's be real. They were great to watch at the height yeah. of making Champions League final and all that. They had great that to edge, watch. That great to watch. Well, they were was. physical. They, they were, were. They were. They physical. asserted themselves on you. And it was. It, they were the masters of a style that they could impose on the opposite. And you had this real blend. Whereas now yeah. you just have this team that are a bit like, nah, we don't really know what we don't, we aren't capable of doing what our manager likes us to do. So let's just be here and exist. And uh, that was what it feels. It just feels like they're killing time until the manager goes when the manager really, if this is how Seretso feels, the manager should really just say, clear the house. And like, you know, like Nigel says, get me on the phone, get me Declan Rice and as many players like Declan Rice as we can afford, which is none. <laughs> <laughs> Great points from both of you on La Liga. Thank you so much for that one. Look forward to watching El Clasico. Look forward to seeing how Atleti handle Atletic Bilbao this weekend. Let's move on to the Premier League. There's a big game. I mean, probably one of the biggest games in the Premier League we've watched for a very long time because Liverpool right now are struggling in the Premier League. The 10th in the table. Only 
The two games won from eight so far for Jurgen Klopp's Redmen. Uh, Manchester City second in the league so far, scored 33 goals from the eight games played. They did rest Erling Haaland a little bit in uh, the Champions League this week. But this is a cracking game, James, to look forward to. I mean, we're, we're going to witness a Liverpool side who have just thrashed Glasgow Rangers by seven goals to one, which I'm sure is a confidence booster. Jurgen Klopp saying so after the game, the fans needed it, the fans deserved it. But how on earth do Liverpool get the job done if anything, they can do against this Manchester City side who score so much? Well, I mean, last year, these were the two best games in the whole European fixture calendar, especially the one at the Etihad, I thought was magnificent. And I think in terms of the, the sheer level, I think you could say it was a sort of peak moment, one of the peak moments in Premier League history. And I do not think we are getting anything like that again, which is a real shame. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason there's something isn't quite sparking right with Liverpool. And I, I get the feeling that at the moment, Jurgen Klopp is making it worse, not better. That's not me at all suggesting that Jurgen Klopp should be under pressure. He has earned the right to take as long as he needs to work this out. But even against Rangers, and I know it's weird to pick the holes in a 7-1 win, but go and look at that first goal, the Rangers goal that they concede. These chasms yeah. of space through the middle, because... Klopp has switched to a sort of 4-4-2, 4-2-4, where he's asking old midfielders, I think in this case was it was Fabinho was one of them and, and Henderson, I want to say. But he's asking two old midfielders to do the job, a job that really three used to do when they were a lot younger. I mean, this really struck me as well at the Emirates last Sunday. Liverpool would basically switch from a four chasm, like a huge, this huge bit of empty space, six, to a six chasm four. I don't understand why they think that's going to work. And if they're going to just cede central areas to Man City, like they did to Arsenal, like they even did to Rangers, mm -hmm. they're going to get pulled to pieces. I think this could be really, really tough for them, especially, you know, losing players like Trent Alexander-Arnold, losing players like Joel Matip. I, I can see in the comments, Natalie saying that Liverpool are going to do Arsenal a favour this week. I really don't see anything here other than a fairly comfortable Man City win. I hope I'm wrong. I hope we get the games we did last season because that was football at its absolute peak. I don't see it happening, though. Oh, James, James, James. This is the game you flip it on, not bloody oh, Barcelona winning. Have you seen Barcelona play the top caliber team? This is the game where you can say that because right now, this is the game that everyone's looking for. And I agree with James. We're not going to get the classic Liverpool Man City that we got two, three years ago, which the whole world was watching. And if you weren't watching, what were you doing? So I think for me, this the win is a big win. I think, again, still, we go back to all the time we say it, Ian. Mane is mm -hmm. a massive miss for Liverpool. Diaz is a big loss now with his situation not going to be ready till after the World Cup. Diaz is a mm -hmm. big, big miss for Liverpool, especially in a game like this. But I think Jurgen Klopp realises now he doesn't have that old team of the high pressing that they used to do against Man City to make them uncomfortable. Reality now is they're going to have to sit deep and they're going to be compact. And the thing about Man City is you don't want to, like you said, James, let them go in the middle because that's where they want to play. Intricate little football in the, in the middle of the pitch, little one twos. They want to go right down the heart of you. They're not notoriously going to go wide. But the sad thing is now is you have to slightly adapt to them going wide because they've got Haaland, who's dominant in the air. And as we've seen with the bromance he's got with De Bruyne, he can cross the ball from anywhere. Mm -hmm. But you definitely more so have to be secure right in the middle in the heart of your pitch than being so wide. And you have to kind of be able to deal with it. And now we're going to see, obviously, Vigil Van Dijk against Erling Haaland. That's the matchup that people are going to see. That's the matchup people are going to talk about. Is Van Dijk still one of the best? Who wins, who wins the battle though, Nigel? That's what I want to hear from you. I mean, you've played I in these big games. Who wins, who wins that battle? If I'm honest, if, if I'm honest, I will go yep. in favour of confidence and I think Haaland will win that battle just because of the confidence. And that doesn't mean Van Dijk's a bad defender. Van Dijk is still one of the top defenders we've seen in the game. He's just been having, a bit shaky this season though, Nigel. Shaky this year. Yeah, he's having a dip of form. It happens to the best of us. Like, we all have dips of forms, best players do. So he's having a dip of form right now, and it's a confidence thing through the whole team. It's not just him. But at the moment, you'd have to say the pendulum swings in favour of Haaland right now. So I think it's going to be a, a crazy, crazy encounter, Ian, if I'm honest. And I really just think that Liverpool are going to be a lot more compact, playing counter-attacking football, 
And they yeah. still, no matter what, they still have that ability to nick a win because let fans know, understand this now. As players in that dressing room, if you're in that Liverpool dressing room, yes, you're going through a tough time, confidence is low. But when you know you're playing Manchester City and the world press, the world media, everyone's going to be watching this game. There's an extra bit of adrenaline that you will get just because of you know how big this game is, where maybe past results and form don't really play a big part and you can lift yourself out of it. Put it in the opposite hand as well, people. Let's remember, no one thought Man United had a chance against Liverpool at Old Trafford when Eric Antag took over. And from out of nowhere, Man United got that win. So it could happen the other day, the other way. Mm -hmm. Just one thought, kind of building on Nigel's idea that, um, and I agree that Liverpool will probably look to be a little bit more compact. And I almost wonder, I mean, they've never played a back three before or a back five. This might be a good time for it, but but we shall see. They don't really have too many options at wing back. Um, one thing that I, that really struck me as well, and this kind of goes to talking about them giving up the central areas, against Arsenal, there was a real commitment to play it long, quickly, to kind of go over the press, to exploit an Arsenal for a lot of this season have had a higher line even than City but City are going to park their centre-backs on the halfway line and you hit it hard and you hit it like aggressively in the direction of Nunez and let's assume Salah comes back in the team and you kind of say, say maybe our best chance of winning is to get those guys in a foot race with Akanji, Diaz, whoever it is that that is maybe that's not Liverpool at all it's not the Liverpool we know but it might be the way Liverpool win it's a great point. I mean, I also think that Liverpool being at home at Anfield, you have to think that at some point they're going to really turn the season around for them. To only have won two games so far from the eight that they've played and Jurgen Klopp recognising that there is media pressure. And it seems to me like the pressure is coming more from the media and the noise around people rather than from the Liverpool fans themselves. Liverpool fans yeah. seem to be relaxed, seem to love Jurgen Klopp, seem to understand that, okay, listen, it's not going our way so far, but it's only a matter of time before they turn things around. And I don't hear Liverpool fans complaining. I'm not hearing no. Liverpool fans saying, get rid of Jurgen Klopp. It's all the freaking journalists out there as well who are talking about this and the questions continuously into Jurgen Klopp's direction though, James. The questions are annoying at times when it comes to the press conference and that's why you're seeing this reaction from a Jurgen Klopp. I think he's I know, frustrated. I, but I disagree with you there. Go on, James. I really Go on, tell me why. Tell me why. Jurgen Klopp is a real. I, I am no. You know, I'm not a Liverpool beat reporter, but I've been to enough Liverpool games to know, and I've had enough experiences to know. Jurgen Klopp is a really difficult manager in good times and bad. You know, I've been there in a Champions League uh, semi final, asking him a perfectly innocent question. You know, why is Sadio Mane moved up front? And it sort of was thrown back to me as, oh, do you not think Sadio Mane is good up front? I thought Sadio, this was after the Villarreal game. I was writing a piece on how great Sadio Mane has been up front. Mm -hmm. it, it's a strange thing that maybe a lot of people don't say, because if you kind of got to have a daily relationship with Jurgen Klopp, you don't kind of maybe want to point this out. But he's a difficult, tetchy manager at all occasions. I don't feel like he's really got a huge amount. I don't think we've got anywhere near the, the, the stage where anyone in the media is saying he, he's got to go. Or anything like that. But I think it is fair to say that... Big, he, big um, Gabby's had a lot to say recently, just saying. Yeah, okay, no one with any common sense in the media. <laughs> but it's just, I mean, that, you know, so it uh, happened, didn't it, with, with Dietmar Hamann, where Dietmar Hamann, or some, yeah. a reporter said, Dietmar Hamann, a former Liverpool midfielder, has said this. And the, and Klopp goes, oh, who, you know, who basically says, who cares what Dietmar Hamann says? I well, like you know, as a reporter, I do because I haven't played for Liverpool. Dietmar Hamann has, and he might not have played for this Liverpool team. He might not be in that dressing room, but he's a, you know he clearly knows what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my little rant over Jurgen Klopp is a difficult manager in press conferences. Listen, I hear you. And and I've actually shared pints with Jurgen Klopp. I've spent a bit of time with him. Got to oh, know him. look at me. And, uh, Name drop. I'll I won't say this. Jurgen Klopp. Jesus Don't Christ. Don't care. I'm sitting on a podcast with Nigel Rio Coker. I can drop his name as well at some point if I want to as well. Life is crazy at times. You know that, Nigel. Sometimes you find yourself in a room oh, drinking pints with dear. the most random people. Might dear, as well I enjoy it. You, and if you're going to send you. out a story, here, I'll tell you I'll tell you this quick story before we move on because I know producer Des is trying to get us out of here. Um, I went to an auction in Germany. I played in a game with Jurgen Klopp, he was playing for like the German legends and I was playing for like the Hamburg legends, which is St. Pauli and Hamburg put together. And uh, it was an auction at the night and he had drunk so much. I just, I, I couldn't understand where this was ever going. And he bought a car 
in an auction. He bought like an old like Opal Corsa, you know, like the old Vauxhall Corsas. He bought an Opal Corsa. Like this is Jurgen Klopp. Doesn't need any cars, anything like that. But he just wanted to donate. He wanted to have some fun. And he got himself an Opal Corsa and immediately turned around and flipped it and just gave it away to charity just to have some fun. And I just thought, what a guy. The guy is there having pints with any random person, taking pictures, having fun. But I do believe James Benj that the media is unfair at times to the German. I think the media needs to be a bit more favorable into his direction and respect him a little bit more than they're doing. So I got to go against you right there. I'm not a fan of some of the questions that are being asked in his direction. People sometimes have to realize you can't win every game. You can't play uh, brilliant every single game. And in Liverpool at some point, after such a long period of time playing so well, we're going to have a lull. We're going to have a downtime going through that right now. But this might just be the game where they turn things around. All right, producer Des is asking for predictions. James, I'll start with you. Uh, let's say 3-1 City. Wah. Nice. 2-1 Liverpool. <sighs> Who scores yeah, I for said Liverpool? it. 2-1 Liverpool. Who scores for Liverpool? Salah. Salah, th- what, six-minute hat-trick as well after scoring, uh, coming off the bench at the week at the, during the week against Rangers. Uh, why not, right? Terrific performance from him. Terrific performance from Jota as well. Uh, James Bench, we've got other notable games to have a quick look at before we get out of here. Leeds against Arsenal. Uh, big game for the Arsenal here. Real quickly, comment from you on that game. Yeah, I mean, really important. Obviously, as we speak, they've still got to go to uh, Norway to face Bodo Glimt. Uh, interesting to see that someone like Gabriel Jesus didn't even travel and I'm sure you'll see kind of quite a weakened squad so they will be thinking this is an opportunity to pull a little bit clear in the Premier League I mean the other one I briefly want to touch on before anyone else dives in Aston Villa against Chelsea at the same time as well there's a game where Steven Gerrard even though I think he would do very well to get anything against Chelsea he could well find himself out of a job if he doesn't Nigel, what do you think about that one? Villa against Chelsea, what's your prediction there? And do you think that could potentially happen if Villa lose? It's a massive game for Villa. Chelsea right now are starting to get into the groove of Graham Potter. It'll be a miracle for Villa to get anything, I'm sorry. Because I watched them against Forest, and it's, it's, it is it's a hard watch. Absolute hard watch. James is 100% right. I don't even need to add any more to what James said. Yeah, and that's a crazy, that's the difference right there. Villa fans are actually asking for the head of Steven Gerrard. They're frustrated right now with obviously the performances and what they're seeing out on the pitch. Spurs against Everton, third against 12 right here. Spurs, did they get the victory done? James, do you think they get the job done against Everton? Tough game for them. Yeah, I think I think they will, but this is going to be one of those dreary Tottenham 1-0 wins because Everton are good defensively, um, but don't have a huge amount going forward. So yeah, I, I think Tottenham will, will sort of grind out that 1-0 as they, as they tend to do. Go ahead, Nigel. I, I, I agree with him. I don't know about the dreary, but I just think Tottenham will grind out the result. I think it's probably because James is a bloody Arsenal fan. That's why. Oh, dreary. Hey, I'm completely Tottenham neutral win. on this. Because One more prediction I want to get from you guys before we get out here. Manchester United against Newcastle. I don't want to hear from you on that one, but that should be a good one to watch. I want to get a prediction on the Wolves against Forest. We've got 18th against 19th at the bottom of the table right here. Here's a quick prediction. That one's taking place on Saturday. Nigel, who you got in that one there? Because that was None a tough of them. Still mate draw. <laughs> <laughs> Wolves can't attack. Forest can't defend. Forest aren't very good at attacking. <laughs> so it's probably going to be three all, isn't it? Yeah, it's a draw. <laughs> no, no draw prediction from Nigel Rio Coca. James Bench, thank you so much for joining us. Nigel, I'll see you on the other side of the break here. But James, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Are you uh, going to watch any games? Are you going to enjoy something tonight? What are you doing? Um, I, uh, I, I can't really talk about that, but um. For, for reasons fine. that will soon become clear. But I, I, to be honest, I'm really looking forward to um, Destination Brooklyn, which is way off. And I do have other things to do before then. But I'm actually just really excited to see all you guys in New York. I think that's the thing I'm well, most looking forward to. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you. We're looking forward to seeing you. And Nigel Rio Coker in particular is looking forward to you bringing um, <laughs> obviously some special gifts over. So be expecting a few emails or text messages from Nigel asking for more stuff to be brought over from you. And I hope James, that the right US that, government mate. allows you in. You're going to bring it over for me, James, if I send you a couple I of bottles. I certainly of will. I certainly will. I might need a second <laughs> thank suitcase. Ben, you're a legend. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's take a quick break. When we return, we'll take a look around at what's happening in the rest of Europe, including a dive into Le Classique as Paris Saint-Germain take on Marseille. Italy's greatest soccer. Is there anything this man can't do? Europe's most exciting title race. And there's the goal. The battle for the Scudetto is on. Stream every Serie A match live exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. 
Welcome back, everybody. You're watching Keiko Lato. See, enjoy alongside my good friend and co-host Nigel Rio Coker here. Let's get stuck into the rest of the best of what's happening around Europe. We'll start off with Le Classique. It's Paris Saint-Germain against Marseille. First against third in the French League. Marseille doing very well domestically and now actually starting to get some results together in the Champions League. you got to give them a lot of credit. But Nigel, more importantly, obviously the noise around Mbappé. How much does that affect the locker room at PSG going into a big match like this against Marseille? Well, you know you've got to win. Otherwise, Marseille could really start to challenge. A hell of a lot, Ian. Come on, you know it. Think about now being back in the days in the dressing room when things like this were happening at the club. That's all the press and the media were talking about. And if you're Marseille, it's going to be in your benefit without a doubt because there's still going to be that unrest in the dressing room. There's going to be, he said, she said, reports coming out. Mbappe really has destroyed and disrupted that Paris Saint-Germain dressing room. And you'd have to feel for Marseille, they've really got nothing to lose. It's all to gain because they're really is kind of like a, not just a disruption, but there's a bit of a volcano happening in that Paris Saint-Germain dressing room right now. And it's because of Mbappe. So I think for me, it goes in favour for Marseille. They're getting the results. They beat, beat Sporting, even though some help with some crazy red cards, but they got the job done. Confidence is there. And you do think that this could be Paris Saint-Germain's first defeat of the season, I believe, right? Well, it's, yeah, they haven't lost yet. And Marseille have only lost one game so far this season. So it is a close game, first against third. There's three points separating the two teams there. And But as you witnessed, obviously, in the Champions League, we haven't watched the games necessarily so closely. But Marseille, is there anything from them that makes you think that they could really turn this over? As you, you predicted, this could be a defeat for Paris Saint-Germain because of the noise and what's happening around PSG. Obviously, you can see disgruntlement and Jonathan Johnson broke it down on yesterday's podcast. Go back and watch it if you want to about exactly what's happening with Mbappe and the noise around potentially the club hiring people to, to put silly social media messages out there, criticizing their own players, which is absolutely unthinkable. All of this noise off the pitch absolutely won't help him. But what about Marseille? Marseille are doing things the right way. Bit poor to start the Champions League campaign, as you mentioned. Back-to-back -back wins against Sporting. They've got a great deal of experience. Alexis Sanchez is scoring goals for them. They are playing some really good football. Amina Hari, terrific player. He's playing very well for Marseille. Tavares is doing well on loan from Arsenal in that left-back slot. If I'm not mistaken, he's already scored three goals in League One. So what about this Marseille that makes you think that they could get this job done going forward? I mean, I'm, I'm not as an expert on Marseille as much as you are, so you probably could give that insight greater than I can. But for me, I think that they've got the experience. And you talk yes. about um, the players that they have there already. Uh, I know a few of them, but I think what I'm looking at most, Ian, is the fact of from indifferent results that they've had at the start of this campaign, they're coming back to turning it around. And it's just at the right vital time, you feel. And you're not facing the Paris Saint-Germain side that's full of confidence, all guns blazing, doing so great. It's a Paris Saint-Germain side that the world media is going to be in on right now looking for any sniffs and scratch. This is just the start of this Mbappe scenario. More stuff's going to come out and it's just going to make it very uncomfortable for players and players are going to get frustrated with having to deal with this while Marseille have come through adversity in the results that they've had in different results and they're starting to click at the right time. They've got yeah. enough experience in that dressing room to get the result. Yeah, I'm with you. Listen, I just want to run through the starting 11 for Marseille that they put up against uh, Sporting this past week and the names that you will recognize, not necessarily for obviously what they've done domestically in the French League, but also some names who are on loan and have competed in other top five domestic leagues, including the Premier League. You've got Lopez in goal and Bemba, Bailly. And then Balerdi, I mean, that's an incredible back line that Marseille yeah. have right there. Youth and experience. Tavares on the left back slot, obviously struggled to get into the Arsenal lineup. He's doing so well at Marseille. Immediate impact. And as I mentioned before, I think he scored three goals. Veratou, who obviously we know from the Italian league. Um, then they have Klaus, Runiger, Genduzi, and then Amine Hari, who I know from my, his time at Schalke in the Bundesliga, and then Alexis Sanchez scoring goals up front. And they also have some weapons coming off the bench, including some youngsters as well, including, obviously, experienced Dimitri Payet and Cengiz Under. I mean, they have got also together. Gerson as well, right? They've got yes. Gerson as well, who yes. came from Flamingo. He's a fantastic talent, box-to-box -box midfielder. Just hasn't yeah. quite found his feet there, but he's a talent as well. Yeah, he's struggling to actually get into the team. He has scored a couple of goals already in League One, um, but he's struggling to get in the team and keep his place in the team. But there is a battle, as I've mentioned, the names who played against Sporting. There is a real battle for Marseille. Um, remember that PSG will not have uh, Sergio Ramos along that back line there. He got sent off in the first half of their last League One game. So that is a big loss for them domestically. Um, Messi still struggling with that calf injury. Expect him to have some problems. Kimpembe, Sanchez and Mendes also struggling. 
Um, I, and as I mentioned before, Ramos is missing as well. The only one missing for Marseille is Kolasinac. So going to be a cracker. Le Classique, make sure you tune in and watch that one. Expect to see a shocker. Nigel Riococo, your prediction will be what scoreline? I honestly see a Marseille win. I just feel it's one of them now where everything is coming. I see a 2-1 Marseille win. Ramos is going to be a big miss in that back line. And let's be real, Paris Saint-Germain haven't looked very convincing at all defensively. Yeah, they've looked poor defensively, even the goalkeeping. And at times, some t and I wouldn't just say necessarily defensively, by the way, I'd say offensively as well. With no Messi in the lineup and all yeah. the noise around Mbappe, I would be concerned about what they do going forward. Um, obviously, my prediction would say that PSG should win this game. Um, obviously, being at a, a, a home in this match. But Marseille, I would absolutely love it, Nigel, if Marseille got the victory. Because it would make the French League a little bit more enjoyable to see a, a little bit of a title race once again this year at the top of the table. So let's hope that that happens. Um, but good luck to PSG and Marseille in that game. Let's turn our attention to Serie A and what's happening in Italy. Not great fixture list, but there is the, the Tour and Derby to look forward to. Juventus in eighth place in the table. Only won three games, Nigel, from the nine games they've played so far. Um, if Torino beat Juventus, and listen to this one, if they beat Juventus, they'll leapfrog Juve in the table and push them further down. Um, can you understand why Allegri is still in charge of this club. Do you, can you make any sense of it? Is it okay for him to be committed to Juve and Juve to be committed to him to the long term, knowing that it's only a matter of time before he gets it right? Or should he have been gone by this point? I just think that it's financial burden. That's what it is. It's a financial situation that they can't get rid of him and that's why they're sticking with him. I don't think they're sticking with him because they truly want to. It's the finances that's playing a part. And for me, it's just not going to get any better. Juventus really have been poor and underperforming this season. And I'll be honest with you, Ian, I wouldn't be surprised with a Torino win just because of what I've seen from Juventus domestically and also in the Champions League, that I, I can actually see a Torino win. And the hierarchy there saying that Allegri is going to stay there no matter what players have to get on with it, it's only going to get worse. Yeah, I'm with you on that one here. Uh, one more point I want to get from you. Um, obviously, a player that I've touched upon so many times from Juventus is Vlahovic. And um, he just doesn't seem to fit in perfectly with what's happening at Juventus Football Club. How do you get a player like him playing well? I know you've played with some top players, Nigel. And there are times where strikers struggle. They struggle to score goals and they are world-class players or they should be scoring goals. And maybe they're missing opportunities. Or is it a problem with Juventus and the system that Allegri likes to play? Does he just simply not fit into the system? He doesn't fit into the system, Ian. He doesn't. You look at the goals he was scoring. Yes, obviously, he's got a high penalty conversion rate of Florentina, but he needs service. Any top strikers or strikers of that kind of caliber need service. And right now, you've got uh, Di Maria who came back, and I think now he's injured now for Juventus. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Pogba, who probably is one of the most creative midfielders I've seen in world football of this generation. He's not fit. He's, not out. he's out for a while. They just don't have the players of that caliber who can make it easy for Vlahovic to get in the right opportunities. You know, I, I believe that for me, strikers, top strikers do their business at the high end of the pitch. How often do we really see him in the high end of the pitch working and doing the business? Yes, Allegri has kind of passed the management style of what the modern game has become. But mm -hmm. again, Juventus is showing commitment to him. There's nothing you can do about that. But with the players that he has, it's not that great. And then you can see, obviously, this banner that our fantastic producers put up there, which uh, reads... Uh, Mr. Ag Algeri, do not resign. Allegri. The Algeri. All right. All right. Allegri. Maybe, maybe fancy you. Anyway, <laughs> do not resign. <laughs> Those who fight against you are not worthy of this shirt, which means the fans are turning their attention more to the players than it is the manager. And again, mm. is that blind loyalty by the fans because of what Juventus used to be under him years ago compared to what they are now? So mm -hmm. there's a lot going on at Juventus right now. And I feel personally, it's only going to get worse. Yeah, listen, it's an interesting point. Obviously, Juve going into this game in a derby game, it's probably the worst possible time you could go into it. You just lost against Maccabi Haifa in the Champions League. Now, obviously, it's a bit of a, a difficult task for them in the Champions League to try and get out of that group. Um, it's frustrating what's happening at Juventus Football Club, but injuries haven't hurt them. Di Maria not available for 20 days due to this muscle injury. He did pull up with a hamstring injury. Um, he is expected to be fit for the World Cup, but this is a massive blow. And as you mentioned, Paul Pogba also out injured. I think he's going to be back around about mid-November as well. So you should see Di Maria and Paul Pogba coming back around mid-November. Oh, by the way, that's when the Italian league shuts down and every other domestic league shuts down and they go to a World Cup. So interesting timing for those players to come back. And maybe for 
Argentina. This is a bit of a positive, by the way, that Di Maria is getting a three-week break before coming back to getting into football again. Not good for Juve uh, in this game in particular. I think it's a tough one, Nigel. I do obviously favour Juve. I think the bookies would say so as well. But Torino, with that little golden carrot, if they beat Juve in a derby game, they go above Juventus in the table. Yeah. For me, that tells you everything. It is going to be a battle in a derby game. Just give me a little bit of insight from your life, your professional career. What was the best derby game that you played in? Best, best game. Like, what was the best derby fans and all? Uh, I mean, for me, it's, it's West Ham Tottenham. West Ham Tottenham was just amazing. I think one of the best ones was towards the end of the season, last game of the season, we played Tottenham and they needed to win to finish in the Champions League. And that was when they were being managed by Harry Redknapp. And the night before, they claimed food poisoning, but we beat them at home. And that was just an amazing derby because Tottenham didn't make it into the Champions League. So that was probably one of the best ones. But the fans get up for that. When yeah. when derbies like that happen, everything's out the window, honestly. And, and yeah. it, it's just, I guess it's kind of the underdog, which is Torino in this case. They have more to kind of gain and nothing to lose, really, because Juventus still are going to be seen as the favourite. So you can really be that person that puts, pulls out a tremendous upset. Yeah, listen, uh, I'll tell you this quick story. My favourite derby was obviously the Hamburg derby, St. Pauli against uh, HSV Hamburg. Um, and actually, it's coming up tomorrow on Friday. It's it's one to look forward to. I've been as a fan and also played it as a player. I played for both sides, Nigel, in this derby. I played for Hamburg when I first moved over there, and then I played for St. Pauli after transferring because my heart was St. Pauli. Um, it was amazing. When I left Hamburg, I gave my jersey to one of the supporters. You know how you get the fans who come yeah. to train in the regulars? Gave my jersey to this, uh, this fan, and and uh, he was an elderly man, you know, probably in his like early 70s, late 60s, something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, he was just passionate about the club. So I gave him my jersey and I said, thanks. And he gave me a hug and all this type of stuff. One week later, I signed for the enemy. I signed for St. Pauli. Came back in the derby game and uh, he managed to get my attention as I'm warming up in the derby. And our fans are already there. Flares are going and it's dancing. It's party. It's great atmosphere. And he got my attention in the warm up. And one of the one of the boys next to me pointed out. He said, "Have a look. The guy's trying to get your attention over here." And he's waving. He's waving at me like that. He held up my jersey that I gave him on a stick and set fire to it. <laughs> Legend. That is <laughs> absolutely legendary. <laughs> just, just, yeah, yeah. I don't want your jersey, you scumbag. Get out of here. It was just brilliant. But it, I love derbies. That's it's passion. passion, but that's what the build-up is. It's the media build-up. It's the, yep. uh, all the newspapers, all that type of stuff to look forward to. And Juve, I can only imagine what they're going through right now. It will be hell. But uh, Juve finds some of the best out there in the world. It's what, such a well-supported club there, clearly getting behind Allegri to get things right. Another game to look forward to is Lazio in third place against fourth place Udinese. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that game plays out. We're looking forward to seeing how Juve takes on Obviously, Torino and the Derby more than anything else because of the storylines behind it. So look forward to watching Serie A. Our Paramount Plus uh, team are all over it this weekend. So check them out. Great games. Obviously, great coverage as well around Paramount Plus. Poppy Miller and the crew are just brilliant. So get stuck into it, including the Torino Derby, uh, Turin Derby as well. Let's turn our attention to the Bundesliga. Nigel, I'll probably allow you to ask me a few questions here, but there are a couple of great games to look forward to. We got first place, first place against fourth place, second against third in the Bundesliga. Bayern against Freiburg here. Bayern are four points behind. They should take care of business, in my opinion, against this Freiburg side. But I just I love Freiburg so much. They're just an old school traditional club. Um, they're taking on Bayern, so that'll be a tough one. And then in the other game, Union Berlin against Borussia Dortmund. Berlin are top of the table right now, only lost one game. And they've only let in six goals against this Borussia Dortmund side. So expect both of these games to be a thriller. If you have any questions for the Bundesliga, throw them at me, Nigel. I was just going to say, do you honestly feel that Union Berlin are real title contenders this year from what you've seen so far? Or you just feel that they've had a fantastic start? No, listen, they've had a great start and they've got goal scorers. Becker's got six goals on the season, if I'm not mistaken. Saber to the uh, US International or Jordan Peefock, as he's known, or just Jordan right now. He, <laughs> he's uh, got three goals on the campaign and settled in really well since his move over to Germany in the Bundesliga. Um, they score goals. It's an intimidating place, small little stadium, um, similar to what Freiburg have in a stadium. Um, it's, it's like 20,000, but it's brilliant. I mean, you're in Berlin, but it's in the woods in Berlin, Union Berlin. So you have to walk to the stadium through the 
the woods to actually get to the stadium. It's brilliant. Great setting. Terrifically supported there. So they make it very difficult for any team, including a Borussia Dortmund, to go there and get results. Dortmund, obviously, a little bit of a favourite over Union Berlin, but they shouldn't be right now. I think Dortmund are vulnerable. And Union Berlin have got confidence right now. And you know this, Nigel, because... We weren't always blessed with playing at the top teams in the top divisions. We were sometimes playing lower in the table, fighting mid-table, fighting away from relegation, or even in the lower leagues. When you have that team spirit, yeah. it's very difficult to beat, and that's what Union Berlin have. They're well-coached, they're well-organized, but Borussia Dortmund going there, you would expect to be a favorite in that game, and they are. But I just got a feeling that that one's going to be very tough for Dortmund. Okay, let's go to the other team then. Now, I've watched Freiburg. I must say, I know they're a fantastic club, like you said, but yep. you honestly think that they're more of a serious title contender? Because again, yep. I watched them and honestly, I don't. I wasn't too convinced. I feel that Bayern Munich, yes, as Ian says, there's something not quite right there. They still yep. have too much quality. But do you think yes. Freiburg are serious contenders? No, at least they're finishing not. That top four. They can finish in the top four, yes, because the other teams around them are struggling right now. If you look at some of the teams who are competing in Europe, even Leverkusen, you'd expect them to at some point get things going um, and people expecting them to finish in the top four. Uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach are a team that I tip to maybe finish in top four, Leipzig to finish in top four. So the teams who are outside looking in right now, you would expect to push Union Berlin, Freiburg, all these other teams down away from the top four and then you'd end up with the Dortmunds and the Bayerns at the end of the season at the top of the table. Bayern Munich have surprised me in the Champions League immensely. I'm really impressed with what they've done and how they've handled this situation. I am a huge fan of uh, Ni uh, Nigel, of Julian Nagelsmann. He is a, a terrific coach, but what Bayern is as, as a club, it is so big. And as you mentioned, we were talking about this earlier on. It is so bigger, so much bigger than any individual at the club, including the head coach. It's difficult. It's difficult to deal with the media. It's difficult to deal with the executives. It's difficult to deal with Oliver Kahn and everybody else who's putting pressure on you. A great comment coming in from Rafa right there, you know. Yeah. Everyone thinks that, and it's true. It is true. Who is going to compete with Bayern Munich? I did this on a Bundesliga broadcast about five years ago, and I was furious, right, because Bayern had just lifted well, probably their seventh in a row. And I... At the end of it, we should have all been celebrating Bayern Munich. But at the end of it, I said, I am pissed off watching the Bundesliga now. And I'm probably one of the biggest Bundesliga fans in the United States of America. And I am pissed off watching it because Bayern are just winning so easily. And even this season, when I tell you and everybody else who's watching our show and on HQ or whatever network I'm on, when I'm telling them something's not right at Bayern, even with something not being right, they're still too good, Nigel. They're still too good. They got the quality of the squad. They 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 do business right. They've got a terrific coach. They've got some good youngsters, by the way, coming through their ranks. They should win this league easily. But what I'm pissed off about is the fact that there's no investment from a Dortmund or um, a Leipzig to keep their best players for as long as they possibly can and invest in trying to challenge Bayern. Try to go for them. I want to see a Leipzig and a Borussia Dortmund keep their best players, throw a ton of money at them. And I know they're great businesses by selling players, but I want to see there be a challenge in the Bundesliga. And that's what's really frustrating me. So regardless of the questions you throw at me, Bayern are still the favorites, even when something's not quite right in the camp right there, you know? Yeah. All right, quick prediction. I'm going to give you right here. Uh, Bayern Munich, I think, get the job done against Freiburg. I'm hoping Freiburg do well here. One of my former teammates at St. Pauli's assistant coach at Freiburg, and um, they've got a good thing going, but just nowhere near enough quality. Bayern off their another convincing Champions League victory should win by three or four goals in that game. I think Bayern start to put into top gear in the Bundesliga now, Nigel. You see them start pushing up the table. Um, Union Berlin uh, against Borussia Dortmund. That is a different story right there. I know you don't know much about Union Berlin, but what do you think? Just give me a quick prediction, even if you're just guessing here. I think I'm going to go for an Union Berlin win, if I'm honest. Uh, that's what I'm going to go with. I think they've done well up there. Uh, and again, it's the fact of they're not really competing in Europe either, which plays to the advantage. And Dortmund are being stretched and they're still uh, reinventing themselves of, under the new manager right now. Um, but big shouts out to Jude Bellingham. Fantastic player, one of the top talents of European football. And again, like you said there, there's already talks of him leaving. They're not going to be able to hold him. So um, I'm going to go for an Union Berlin win. 
Yeah, and that's the frustrating part of it, right? They're not going to be able to hold him. Erling Haaland, come come to Dortmund and then, yeah, we'll just sell you on. Just pisses me off, man. I want to see a title race in the Bundesliga more than anybody else. And I want to see Bayern being rattled. And it's not happening. It's not happening in the Champions League. And I don't think it happens this weekend. I'm also going for Union Berlin win this weekend. I think Borussia Dortmund are, are still vulnerable. I really do believe that. But because of the likes of uh, Jude Bellingham pushing this team forward, Jude Bellingham at 19 years old is making every single player in that team better. Would you believe that? I do believe that. I see how he's, he's an outliner. We already spoke about that earlier today. He's one of those outlining talents and that's why all these top clubs want him and he's captain them at Champions League level at his age. Yeah, Adeyemi's better, Daniel Malin's better, even Anthony Modeste at his age is better. Um, it's a shame they don't have Marco Royce because maybe they could do something this season, but yeah, no doubt about it. It'll be a tough one for Borussia Dortmund, unless Jude Bellingham sets up the stage. If he gets an early goal and uh, Dortmund get a, a victory, you'd have to say, just job well done once again. Dortmund love Jude Bellingham. There's no way they're going to let him go easily. Uh, big thanks out to everybody out there for watching the show today. It's uh, It's been awesome, Nigel. What a great week, man. Thank you so much for your efforts. Just brilliant Champions League week. Excellent preview of what's happening in the domestic leagues this week as well, man. Your final thoughts before we get out of here. What game are you looking forward to watching the most this weekend? You'd have to say, come on, man. It's El Clasico. It really is El Clasico. It's the first real challenge for me, in my opinion, for Barcelona. And I want to see how they handle this with exactly what happened this uh, Champions League weekend. That's a big one for me. I got to say, it's the Liverpool game. Because if Liverpool lose and lose heavily to Manchester City, it'll be interesting to see what the media reaction is and what we're all talking about next week. I can't wait for that. So make sure everybody's tuning into the games this weekend. Uh, thanks to everybody out there for joining the show. Kega Lats has been awesome this week with the Champions League. All of your comments, they mean a lot. So please make sure you recommend us to your friends, like and subscribe and try to get them on board as well as we try to grow this beast into a complete animal. It's great to have Nigel Rio Coker, uh, Jonathan Johnson, James Benj, Michael LaHood, always on us as regulars. We have Fabrizio Romano coming on from time to time. We have a regular with him on a Monday, so make sure you check that out this upcoming Monday. But we'll be back on Sunday with a complete review of what's just gone down. We'll be discussing exactly what's happening with Liverpool and Manchester City. We'll check in on what's happening with uh, El Clasico, Le Clasique, and all the games we've previewed today. And we'll see if Turin is still on fire. Thanks to everybody out there for watching Keiko Lat. So please take a minute to leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple podcast spotify stitcher and anywhere else you listen to your podcasts so make sure you subscribe we're also available on video unfortunately for nigel subscribe to us on youtube visit youtube.com forward slash kegolazzo see you next time everybody enjoy the weekend enjoy the games nigel rio coca love you brother